So, Paul, you said that philosophy is relevant to practice. How is that? Well, there's a rising note of suspicion in your question, and I suppose I recognise where that comes from. It's certainly the true, true that sometimes philosophy has presented itself and understood itself as in somewhat abstract terms. But really, if one goes back to ancient philosophy, we find that the mode of inquiry is intimately tied to the question of how should one live. So it's the most practical matter in a certain sense. But perhaps I can respond in, in two ways to try to show why I think it's relevant in, to practice. First of all, at a macro level and then at a micro level, with a coda at the end. Um, at the macro level, uh, we can look at Descartes in the early 17th century, who develops this philosophy which separates the mind from the body, as is well known. And following on from Descartes, we find that for four centuries, people in the Western world are Cartesian dualists. Of course, most of them have never heard of Descartes, but nevertheless, it's commonplace to accept that the mind is detached from or somehow mysteriously connected to the body. It's a very different way of looking at the, the human being that one finds in East Asia, for example. So that's one, one way. If one looks in more recent times, in the early 20th century, we have the rise of logical positivism in Vienna and in London to some extent. And then one finds that the world is understood in terms of fact and value, where the two are sharply disconnected, and where questions of value are thought to be mere matters of subjective preference, not having any objectivity attached to them. Now, although logical positivism is widely discredited and rejected in philosophy subsequently, it still retains its effects in ordinary people's thinking and indeed in many of our institutional practices. So that if one reads educational research nowadays, one finds that it's full of assumptions about the subjectivity of value judgments. And these are deeply pernicious when one is concerned with education. So philosophy is giving you, giving us all, a moment for pause, then you would say? Certainly. And that's the macro level. If I turn to the micro level, then I think one can look at practices within education, such as uh, the teaching of a maths class to primary school children. And most practicing teachers would recognize that there is a wide range of judgment that they're engaged in when they see the way in which a child approaches a task and how well that child copes with that task. This range of judgment will extend beyond questions of whether the child gets the right answer. The teacher will want to know the context within, what, within which the child has learned this, how well they can reason through what they're doing, uh, how well they can generalize this knowledge or apply it elsewhere. And often that will apply, require a wide range of ability on the part of the teacher, not simply a matter of checking that the particular test has been satisfactorily passed. So that kind of accepted knowledge that the primary teacher has is something that the current understanding of teacher education tends not sufficiently to value. And it's certainly something that the prevailing assessment regime tends to have failed to appreciate. So a fish doesn't realise it's in water, so philosophy helps you to see that surrounding, that context? Well, at the particular context I've talked about, uh, philosophy would acknowledge the things that the teacher ordinarily knows. The tendency of theorizations of teaching and pedagogy and assessment has been to deny those things we ordinarily know in favour of a more technical understanding of what's going on. So the coda I was going to add, that's after the macro and micro levels, is that if one looks at the field of educational research or social science research more generally, one finds that there is an initiation into educational research methods, which is often quite strongly technicist in, in kind. One effect of that is the way that theory itself is cast, and specifically how philosophy is cast. So I'm thinking of a number of educational research methods textbooks, for example, books that are regarded more or less as Bibles by those in the field. And very often in those, in those books, one finds a section on philosophy or theoretical framework, which is highly abstract, which is full of a catalogue catalog of isms and ologies, many of which don't seem to have any very ready connection with practice. In my view, this is a, a profound misunderstanding of what philosophy is about. And it's certainly a long way away from that ancient question of how one should live. So if I'm a teacher or an educator and I, I, I don't know that I don't know the skills of philosophy, how do I suddenly get them? Are you suggesting that there should be training of, of uh, new teachers, new educators? How, how do they get that? Certainly, I think that uh, um, an element of philosophy can contribute very richly in, in the training of undergraduate uh, student teachers and indeed in postgraduate certificates in education. 
And from my own experience, I found students very responsive to forms of inquiry like this. It's very easy to do this in a way that starts from problems in the classroom, precisely the kind of things that teachers are most anxious about, and then moves out from those problems by simply pressing harder and harder what the problems are and what questions arise within them. My own experience has been that when one does this, one quickly comes up to questions about the nature of knowledge, in other words, central questions in philosophy, in epistemology, the nature of knowledge and how one learns, but also central questions in ethics to do with the nature of the good life. After all, even in teaching this little item in mathematics that I referred to earlier on, why is it we're teaching this particular uh, thing? How does it fit into a broader development of mathematical understanding? Why is this form of mathematical understanding more significant than another? Now those questions can't be answered really without, in the, in the absence of some conception of the good life. So ultimately one finds oneself going to the biggest questions in philosophy. So the point about being relevant to everyday practice is that it has to be gotten across in such a way that it's immediate, it's practical, it's not dry abstract analytic theory. Well, one thing that philosophy can do to help itself is to provide plenty of examples. So one might, for example, begin with um, the theory or the, the ideas of a great philosopher, but then those can be illustrated with examples drawn from educational practice. Conversely, one can begin with the practice itself and consider the challenges that a teacher faces in the classroom in such a specific context as the one I've just referred to and then work out from that to questions about whether the child needs to learn to count his change properly or whether more, what's more important is to understand something of the beauty of relations between number or beauty of relations in, in geometry, for example. We've spoken before about uh, the marginality or otherwise of philosophy. You're saying it seems to be integral to a questioning in mind and pass passing that on to or encouraging that in, in the students that we teach. Yes, I would say that ultimately the questions about what's worth doing and how we come to know what's worth doing, questions about how one should live one's life, are questions that are unavoidable in human experience. Or let's qualify that. Let's say that one can avoid them, but only with a kind of evasion, by shutting one's eyes, by limiting oneself in one's way of understanding one's world sometimes through technical means, sometimes through succumbing to the forces of conformity. But really those questions persist. They're questions that as human beings we all face. So it's a matter of attending to those matters rather than retreating to some sort of theoretical world of abstraction from them. So that attending then is not a subversion. It's not some sort of anarchistic thing. It's uh, giving yourself a moment to pause to ask these, one of these perennial questions. There's nothing subversive about that. Well, I think there is, given the prevailing regime, and that is that uh, we live in a world which is dominated by the media in its various forms in many respects, uh, a world in which technology is clearly uh, dominant in, in very much of what we do. And I'm not just talking about its immediate effects, as for example in a studio such as this where one's looking at a camera. I'm thinking of the ways in which technology restructures our thinking, for example through its effects in, in management, with the dominance of databases and spreadsheets, which channel the kinds of, or, or re reconfigure the kinds of information that we need to provide for the institution to run well. So managerialism seems to be a spectre that's rising, which you would say we need to think about some more. Well, certainly. I, mean, I think over the last 30 years, the uh, figure of the manager has changed. There can be no doubt that institutions need to be managed, nor is there any doubt that uh, institutions need to have systems of accountability in some form or other. But the particular way these have converged and the way they have uh, developed alongside ICT has meant that our modes of thinking about these things, the categories of our understanding, are more restricted than they were. And this has at the same time apparently given us greater flexibility, but in fact undermined the trust and continuity of relationship on which successful institutions depend. Paul, I think that's an interesting point, which I'd like to pick up again with you at some point in the studio. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.